Welcome to Pod Crushed. My name is Penn. I'm with my co-hosts Sophie and Nava. We had Matthew McConaughey on today. Woo! All and right, um, all right, all right, all right. That man shines <laughs> and like radiates. What is what is that? I couldn't stop thinking about what it would have been like in person, partially because Sophie and David pranked me and told me he was coming in person. But I oh, couldn't stop wow. thinking about what it would have been like in person because the energy coming off of Matthew on yeah, Zoom, he gives, yes. I was yeah. like blown away. I could like barely handle his energy in the best way. Yeah, this man like, did not know who this? I was, had no yeah. idea who I was. That did not matter. <laughs> He by the end of the interview, he was digging in. Yeah, he was digging in. Just like in. we talked like about, he, Pan. G- he gave us his <laughs> all. No. And by the end, I'm just talking like I'm just like, yeah, man. Yeah, I'm a yeah, bullshitter yes, too, man. Absolutely. <laughs> It's infectious. What in the hell? It made me want to move to the South. I've never wanted to. I can't remember when I lived in Virginia. I lived in Virginia for seven years. No Mm. recollections. Yeah. I told you guys there's something great about Texas. I told you. It's Matthew McConaughey. (laughs) No, it was amazing when we told Nava, when David and I pranked her and told her that he was coming in person. I Successfully? Like, how long did that last? Just like maybe, maybe 30 seconds. I thought. I believed it. I completely believed it. The reason it only lasted a few (laughs) seconds was because she was so confident she was i was like oh well this kind of sucks like this isn't a good no. prank like <laughs> I she thought, just read green lights is why I, yeah I, I thought she would be nervous but she was like oh my god i love him this is amazing okay let's, let's think about a tiktok, TikTok. It's like, oh, I i'm not planning a tiktok so i have to tell her it's a prank <laughs> No, it was great. It was I like great. I like that the prank ended oh so you didn't look bad. You're like, oh no, yeah. sorry, no, no TikTok because not, not yeah. doing extra work. <laughs> okay, I have to say that the there's an episode that's out, Rob Lowe, and I've never gotten more DMs and text messages from people who know me really well to be like, you were so smitten the whole time, la la. Really funny. So this interview, I was like, do not be smitten in front of Matt. You need to be cool. Like you can't be You're thirsty. Like trying to twirl I your could hair not stop like, smiling. No. Yeah, but I couldn't stop smiling the whole interview. I was just like, my face hurt. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it was smitten with like romance. No, <laughs> romance. <laughs> no. I don't know. No. I don't know. I mean, may, maybe it's maybe it goes. Maybe. Can we cut this? No, no. <laughs> no, we're keep we're keeping this because because you can't handle it. We're definitely keeping it. Please watch. No, the I, video I don't know version. if I've ever seen Nava turn red. Please watch the video oh, version of this dancer. <laughs> Just for <laughs> this. What's happening? <laughs> We're off the rails. For the first time ever, I feel like we're legitimately off the rails. And for that reason, <laughs> I'm just, we are keeping this. I don't care how long it goes. I don't care how long it goes. I was, say I was smitten with him as a human. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. I think I was yeah, just yeah, smitten yeah. with him as a person. Yeah. yeah. Well, good luck convincing anyone Apparently of that now. <laughs> no, that's, no, come on. I, I mean, no, no, th- that is probably the m- most, look, we all have different qualities. He's the most charming yeah. Yeah. human I can recall meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, who knows what that is? It's true. Anyway, yeah. I hope you guys stick around and yeah. love it as much as we did. Well, and 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 actually, as as I say in the beginning of the interview, because of the strike, oh, we just mm-hmm. we just like talk about life mm-hmm. and some of his book, a little bit, but really just <laughs> just about life. So it was nice. Come on down, just gather around a fire. You kick up your feet. You enjoy this one. <laughs> this one's for you. Welcome to Pod Crushed. We're your hosts. I'm Penn. I'm Nava. And I'm Sophie. And I think we could have been your middle school besties. Practicing our best. All All right, all right, right, all right. right. Let's just start at 12. Let's start at home and then go out from there. Your your life at home at 12. Life at home at 12. So my hero, my brother Pat, 81, 88, 7. He's 19. He's just moved out of the house. I'm now the only child. My oldest brother, Rooster, has been out of the house. So my hero just moved out of the house. Mm-hmm. My dad was working a lot. I, I mean, my mom was doing most of the raising of me. It was clear what was expected. I mean, I just now took over all the yard duties, the weed eating and the, and the mowing the lawn because Pat was gone. Um, but, and we had just moved to Longview, Texas, which was a huge city to me coming from Uvalde. It was 75,000 people. And, um, um, we lived off in the country. I remember the days in the summer, as I wrote about in the book, were filled with daylight to sundown outside. Mm. 
my mom was big on you couldn't watch we weren't allowed much television my mom's one liner was always don't watch somebody do what you want to be doing get out there and go find out do it yourself mm -hmm. um so the days there's sort of a rule in our house if it was daylight you had to be out at 12 i was well on my way um, I was in second place behind a guy named Kelly Hernsberger for best at, from uh, best attendance since kindergarten. Wow. All right. Now, fast forward a minute. We got to the senior year, 18 years old. I had missed seven days since kindergarten. Wow. What? Kelly Hernsberger missed four. <laughs> Kelly. So you, were, you were always so this was something every year you were perpetually in second place to this this guy. Wait, Matthew, I have girl. to know what would cause you to miss a day because it seems like it would take a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, for me, look, you didn't want to miss a day in my house. Yeah, because if you could breathe, that meant you had to go do some manual labor. <laughs> you had to go do chores. <laughs> you didn't get to hang in bed. And yeah. I, was, I will say this though, I remember it was a little after twelve. But I got the wisdom teeth pulled, I believe, and I did get to stay at home. And for some reason, I was allowed to have TCBY yogurt, which was a really special thing. Oh, yeah. I had, yo I had yogurt. I had me. I was on whatever the painkillers were for the tonsils. And we had just gotten cable television coming. For, I'd always been, we'd always been a three channel family and mm. when you could watch tv it was a big deal in the house i remember finding wgn the chicago station and the chicago cubs day game came on in in wrigley field and it was a 16 inning two to one pitchers duel and i got to sit there and eat my yogurt and i remember it lasts <laughs> like five and a half hours and that's when i kind of fell in love with baseball wow. i was like this game's great because i was just it was just me my yogurt and a game mm -hmm. on a day off from school and i had the house and your mess. um and whatever meds I was off the top. <laughs> right. um, so that's what it was like at, at home. Um, you know, at school, what, 12? Is that sixth grade? Mm -hmm. Six or seventh. Yeah, yeah. six, seventh. Eight. Yeah, six. So seventh. I mean, you know, sixth is big because you're coming and you're the youngster mm -hmm. of the sixth, seventh, eighth graders. Um, I did like a girl in the eighth grade who had been dating a guy who was in the eighth grade, they were the thing, but when they broke up, I did swoop in there. <laughs> and I remember that led to that, that guy and some of his friends working on me, picking on me on the bus ride home. But I also, because I stood up to it, I remember getting their respect because they were like, who's this kid think he is in sixth grade? You know, da, 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 da. And the, and the girl ended up saying yes when I asked her to go with me. And I remember we we, we kind of hung out. So I kind of, it showed him up, but yet he still kind of was like, okay, well, he did it. But I remember, I remember this. It was a bus ride home. And him and his buddies had been picking on me. You know, hard, uh, the wadded up paper, bam, on the back of the head on the bus and stuff like this. And there was a bunch of them. And it wasn't, it wasn't about going and getting in a fight or anything. It was just about putting up with it. I told my older brother who had come home from, uh, college. And the next day we're driving the bus and all of a sudden the bus driver pulls over on the side of the highway. And I look out, it was my brother. He had pulled a Z 28 and <laughs> pulled the, got out of the car, got on the bus, came back there and said, Matthew, which ones is it? Which ones are they? And I pointed out Scott, hey, then, then, then. my brother told him, he said, do you mess with my little brother anymore i'm messing with you then he went to the bus driver i remember he said this and he must have got this from my dad he goes if you can't handle your bus i'm gonna handle you oh my gosh and never picked on me again <laughs> it was done i was in we were good no more no more wadded up paper balls in the back of the head for you to swoop in like that though i mean you were you because the thing about this age is that kids i have a 14 year old right now and i have a three-year-old by the way um Kids at that age can be so different. Some of them can look like men. Some of them are boys, you know? Like, were you, yeah. I mean, for you to even do that, you must have been a little tall. You must have been, I mean, what was going on? No, I mean, look, physically, I was a late bloomer. Huh. Okay. I mean, can we say the word peach fuzz on this podcast? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ooh, Pete, let's cross it a line. <laughs> we, we... Remember that one? I was, I was that guy. I was the last one with that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, I mean, I wasn't, 
you know, my 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 inseam was always shorter than my waistline. Hmm. So I wasn't long legged. I wasn't fast. I wasn't that tall. Um, I remember I did have one pair of Vel I think Velcro capas had just come out, which gave me a little bit of confidence. <laughs> so I had a clean pair of capas shoes that mm -hmm. Velcroed over. I had my my two pair of JC Penny plane pockets. You couldn't have one two pair. And you didn't get your, I remember mom saying this, you, we will not, will not wash your jeans until they can stand up in the corner on their own. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> so you wore the jeans quite a bit. I remember, I think the old roll them up at the bottom, fold over taper roll up yeah. at the, oh, yeah. the ankle was in. That was cool, which actually made my legs look shorter, but it was still cool. Uh, it felt cool at the time. Um, no, so physically I wasn't. I was I was behind, but I mean I was. So yeah, what was going on inside then? Because that's the is it? Would you call it confidence, or would you? What hmm. would you call that? I, maybe I had confidence from having an older, older, older brother who had you know and taught me, and a dad who had taught me, you know, um, how to respectfully ask a girl to if you if you like them to go out with you. What now? I couldn't do the same things that the eighth grade girl that I was dating could do. Um, but then I also had mom on the other side, which gave us me and my two brothers, a lot of confidence of always going like, she always reminded us this. And, and, and I think we'll hopefully talk about it later if we get around heartbreak, but she was always, my mom to this day has always been a big proponent of, Hey, you remember you're, you're a catch, mm -hmm. you're a catch. You respect yourself and you respect mm -hmm. your own body and you, you, you're the catch. Now that doesn't hold up as well when you're sitting there asking you're sweating and you're asking the girl to go with you but maybe that did give me the confidence to do it in person mm. instead of having a friend to ask or writing the note yeah. right right um you know athletically i had just come out i was just realizing that i wasn't big and i wasn't fast earlier in life, I was not fast. I was big. I was strong. I always had a big butt and big <laughs> legs. So I had a really strong legs and butt. And none of the kids could tackle me mm -hmm. in football in the backyard. I could just, they'd be hanging all off me. And I was like, oh, that's what I'll do. I'll go play football because I'll be the big guy that can't go down. Mm -hmm. Well, all of a sudden, about 12, all the young kids started getting bigger than me and faster. And I remember playing linebacker and uh, in the seventh grade. And it's Marshall. It was in. It was at Longview. It was a Marshall, and the I was playing linebacker. The offensive line on Marshall just completely split our defensive line. Handed off to the running back, who was a twin, five foot ten and a half, a hundred and seventy five pounds, and he was a twin brother, and they both had beards. <laughs> I remember <laughs> seeing this bearded. <laughs> athlete come at me and I'm whatever five oh foot four mm -hmm. one one thirty five and I'm big eyes and I remember seeing this beard well I still got peach fuzz in other places where <laughs> that, that it's supposed to grow in earlier right no I'm not even thinking beard you know what I mean I'm, I got blondes there you know on my, on my legs and everywhere else and I remember he came and ran up and I was like I'm not sidestepping him and I hit him straight and all of a sudden next thing I remember is I came to and my teammates were picking me up, slapped me on the back. I had hit him straight up and I had both of his shoes. He had gotten <laughs> out of my shoes, but I yeah, I was 10 yards. He'd taken me 10 yards down the field, but I had his shoes, but I slowed him down long enough for Corey, our big uh, cornerback to tackle him 15 yards down the field. And it was a big, it was a, kind of a big ride of passage. Now I kind of blacked out for a minute, but I, but I did, I did hit him straight up. I remember that. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned being in sixth grade and and being confident enough to ask out the girl who was in eighth grade, which seems mm -hmm. like it says a lot about you in terms of how you felt around girls or how you felt around crushes. Liking older girls. <laughs> well, just, just, the, just that, that, that sort of confidence we're talking about. Yeah. And uh, I wonder if you could tell it. We ask everybody on our podcast to tell us about their first love and first yeah. heartbreak. And maybe yeah. that's in middle school. Maybe it happened later for sure. you. But could you tell us? No, it's middle school. You know, and this opens up that question that I'm I'm starting to go through. I think I'm on the cusp of it with my children. Mm -hmm. I've got 15, 13, and 10. So definitely with the 15 and 13, it's starting to happen. Yeah. 
you probably know it, uh, Pam, with 14. But this idea of love, that's a big word in my family. You didn't throw that word around. Mm -hmm. To feel it and say it was a very, very big deal to me. And I did. I had a girlfriend. Um, and this, 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 I'm going to tell you the story of the first love and the heartbreak. And they're going to have a common denominator of the breakup. And they broke up with me. Mm -hmm. I went away on a, um, um, like a field trip with a class to Madrid. And while I was, you know, you have an allowance, right? And what do you do with that allowance? You spend it all on something for your girlfriend <laughs> that you love, right? You don't forget everything else. They, you forget all the other people. They don't, they, they, they don't need a gift when I get back. But I got her this necklace. And then I got her this like crystal trinket. And then I got her like something else. And I came back and I unloaded these gifts on her. It was too much. It scared her. And she broke up with me. Right after I'd given the, all these gifts. And but you know that, but you know what it is. We've all felt it on mm. the giving and on the receiving side. It's like for whatever reason it was, it was too much. The gifts, it was too many gifts. And she broke up. And I remember we crying and, and and having sleepless nights and really having trouble getting out of bed in the morning. And I remember my mom coming back to my bed and telling me, look, I, I feel for you as positive as my mom always was. Mm. She could always tell with us kids when we were really hurting and come back and sit with us and go, let's sit here in the pain for a minute. I know this sucks. I know this hurts. Mm. And to hear that and then eventually get to now, remember, you're a catch. She's going to notice what she lost and all of us then start building the confidence. Mm. But mom was always good about sitting. Let's sit in the pain right now. Your first heartbreak. That was the first one. The second one was later in middle school in the eighth grade. I met someone and it was going crazy. Aww. It was going. And she said to me, wrote me a note and it said, I love you. And I was just, whoa, the feelings all the way to my fingertips out of my heart. I was, oh my God. And two weeks later. Oh no. I said it to her. And the next day. Hmm. She broke up. Hmm. Do you think it had to do with you sharing your feelings or coming on maybe what was too strong for her? What do you, what was it? Well, it was that, but you know, I mean, again, we're going to try and break down the, 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 the science and math of love, which we know is a foolish idea thing to do anyway, because <laughs> if anything, love's not really dignified. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not fair, mm -hmm. but the too many gifts were, uh, I guess it was, a, it, it intimidated uh, her, her, or maybe there's that thing that we do young where, oh, now I know I got you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. You know, I felt that before on my side where I felt somebody give it, I was like, oh, well now uh, you're just fully committed to me. Okay. Had I you, felt that before. But you probably felt that after these incidents, right? Yes. So, after. so these two, uh, right. uh, and the, I love you. She, even though she had said it first, yeah. Soon as I said it, two weeks later, she broke up. And I remember that being a major heartbreak and made me very confused about, well, the, what's the love thing? What's the I love you mean? Yeah. You know, because she opened up to me mm -hmm. and said it first. And now I came back, reciprocated, and we were supposed to meet in the middle and go higher and become more full. And now she went, oh. And so for her, you know, now I'm older, I look back and I go, that's probably how she was feeling. She was a beautiful and pretty and affluent and 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 I was the only guy in town, you know, that she could date. And and I think getting that, I don't know. I didn't study her history. Did she have a track record of getting guys in as soon as you got them to say that word? But that that was that's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. That was the hinge that was like, okay, check. I felt like it was a check mm -hmm. for her. Mm -hmm. Ah, got him to say I love you. Okay. Later. Move on. Did it make you more gun shy for like future relationships? Probably, probably, you know, and I've still to this day, you know, one of my favorite scenes, if y'all ever see it, and you ever see the film Adaptation? Yes. Spike Jones it's one of my favorite movies. movies, yeah. You know the scene where Nicolas Cage, his brother's talking to his brother, he plays both the characters, and they're sitting, the, the Chris Cooper characters, the Meryl Streep are coming through the swamp, mm, hunting him down, mm. and he goes, 
you gotta tell me about that girl Karen, man. They think they're about to die. He goes, you gotta tell me about that girl Karen. Remember she said, you wanna go to prom with me? And uh, um, and you said, yeah. And and then all her friends were there laughing because it was a joke. She never, she never wanted to go with you. She just wanted to dupe you. He's like, how'd you get over that so quick? And he goes, well, I loved her. He goes, I know that she, she duped you. He goes, no, my love didn't depend on her loving me back. Mm -mm. I unconditionally loved her. Go for it. And it was, it's a beautiful yeah, little scene. Yeah. Love. Now, not one that in our youth, I think we can dare really understand. We can intellectualize it, but damn, she don't feel like that. Yeah. Sure didn't feel like that to me then. It felt unfair. It felt, I was scared of love. I was scared mm -hmm. of the word. I was much more trepidation to use that word. And I backed off and looked at the people in my life that were my family and one friend that I could say, I love you. And I knew it was reciprocated no matter what. So I was very wary about when to ever, when to next say that word or share that. Definitely. Somebody. Yeah. I mean, so what we've found, so in the first season of this show, we actually had a lot of uh, 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 listeners submit stories. And what we got, what we found is that things like this can stick with people maybe their whole lives. And I feel like you certainly can appreciate that that you, you seem to tap into the last uh you know what i don't know decade or so tapping into this idea that people are really in need of encouragement you know what i mean and i'm just wondering if um because you have have represented a certain kind of icon of masculinity there's no doubt about mm -hmm. it i mean i'm not making any estimations of how you feel on the inside but that's a, you know that's really significant and it's really interesting to me and i think other people like mm. what was the right. journey of like young matthew mcconaughey young young like boy becoming a man you know like what like i don't know how long or short you can make that arc <laughs> let me tell you one may go back just before middle school sure. to say something that was really written in my lineage whether i chased it or not which I didn't, right? But it, but it, I understood it. Mm. My dad was a big, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, please, and thank you. Sir's a man guy. And you had to do it, look someone in the eye. And I remember one day meeting some more of his friends who were much taller than me and looking up and shaking their hand and going, nice to meet you, sir, nice to meet you, sir. And the one thing that connected in my mind that day was in the parking lot at Oak, Oak Forest Country Club. It was hot. Mm. The sun was high. They had shades on. And I didn't. My eyes squinted as I looked at him. I remember going, oh, you know what the one common denominator of everybody that my dad has had me say sir to is? They're all fathers. And manhood meant being, being called a sir. Mm. And the one thing about being a man was, oh, they're all fathers. That's the one thing they all are. Mm. So from that day, I was like, oh, you become a father. You become a man. Mm. That's it. That's the ultimate cool. That's the ultimate respect. That's when you become a sir. That's when you go from prince to king. Now, obviously, whatever, I'm 10, 11, 12 years old. I'm not chasing trying to be a father right away, but it was always, it got pressure tested by life throughout in flings I had and times where I thought I'd be single the rest of my life and times where I thought I was going to become a monk or whatever. It was always right there going, no, they don't, don't, that's a diamond. That's mm. a diamond. That's, that's, that's timeless truth right there for you, Matthew. And it never wavered. Um, and so that's what I was always looking forward to mm -hmm. facing. If one day I can become a father hmm. in your book, green lights, I, I, it's one of my favorite books. I'm listening to it. I'm almost done, but I'm listening to it on audiobook. It's, it's so it's so rich to hear you tell these stories. But as I'm as I've been listening to it, I've been getting this sense that your dad is sort of like larger than life, like like kind of almost like a mythic character. Yeah. And I'm wondering now that you're a father and you've been a father for many many years now. Yeah. What are the elements of parenting that you saw? through in your father that you've decided intentionally to to bring into your own fatherhood and are there elements that you have decided to just like gracefully let go of both you know and trying to ride you know trying to do that thing i think that all of us try and do is just have a small ascension mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. be a little bit better dad than maybe dad would be a little bit better friend be a little bit better 
husband, whatever those things, you know, because we learn. That's what that's what we get older for. That's that's what we have hindsight for. Mm -hmm. the, 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 that respect, that sirs and ma'ams, we're still big on those in our household. Mm -hmm. Because the Old Testament way, if we're going to go biblical, is like you do it because it's your elder and you better do it. Show respect. Valid, yes. But also the New Testament thing that I've added on to that is, look, guys, you also do it because you're going to get more of what you want in life if you do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, swing the honey to the bees to the honey. You look, you see though, you see that, you see that person double take back at you and go, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir, for those matters. That, that were, that's that you're building currency <laughs> in relationships with that respect. Um, we don't use the word C A N T can't. Mm. That's something my dad taught me. Don't say can't. That was a bad as a cuss word. That was like taking the Lord's name in vain. Wow. You can go, I'm having trouble. I need some help. Fine. Because that's constructive. My dad was always like, that's constructive. Mm. Mm, wow. Come to me. Maybe I can help you. And if I can't help you, maybe I can find someone else who can help you. But don't say can't. I remember he show us how to do things when we'd say can't. And then, and then maybe a days, week later, and you go, see, you were just having trouble. Mm. You'd be like, you're right. Um, we don't, we're very, we're very delicate with the word uh, hate, which is another thing that, that, that was my mom, my mom was a big stickler on that. You don't hate, especially your loved ones. And I remember throwing that word out at my own birthday party about my brother. And I threw it out to try and sound like I was older because I'd heard the older kids say it. And when I said it, I knew, I, I knew I was like, oh, mom, it was in mom's, it was an ear range of mom. I'm in, I'm, I'm in trouble. That was a dirty word about my brother. Yeah. I felt guilty about it right away. And anyway, I remember getting in trouble in front of everybody at my own birthday. Wow. Anyway, that was embarrassing. Um, you know, the big on big on uh, um, being honest and not lying. I wrote about it in the book, but my 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 dad especially was like, admit you lie, admit you lie, and I talk about it a lot. Then if you admit you, if we admit where we lie, the lies we tell ourselves, we become something much more valuable. Hmm. We become good bullshitters. <laughs> now, I love a bullshitter <laughs> over a liar. I thought you, know? you were going to say Liars. like an honest person. Or <laughs> yeah, wait, wait, wait. So I'm curious, what's the difference? What's the difference? <laughs> Because it's better, while I'm telling you the tall tale, I got a twinkle in my eye and I just gave you a little bit of a wink that lets you know <laughs> yeah. the liar is sitting there going, no, mm. I'm telling you the truth. And I'm defending this. And this is how it was. Now, you're, that's lying. Come on, man. Mm -hmm. Give it the, the little twinkle in the eye of like, <laughs> yes, the, the proverbial fish was only eight pounds, but go with me on this one. It was 12. Mm -hmm. no, that's fun there's there, there there's poetry in that there's drama there's leniency there's bullshit there's hey let's jive let's get a vibe going here that's something different than being a straight liar now in our family my dad would rather us i'm gonna tell that story in green lights about the pizza story i got in trouble from him not because i stole the damn pizzas because i lied about mm. and said i didn't mm -hmm. And like he told me, he's like, buddy, I've stolen plenty of pizzas, man. <laughs> Number one, you either need to get, you need to talk to me about how to get away with it better. <laughs> or, and, you know, what's the, you, why'd you lie to me? And I remember seeing that look on his face when I got in trouble. That I was, I talk about it in, 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 the, in the book. It was a very emotional moment because I felt like I'd let him down. I saw in his eyes a look like, am I, where have I failed raising my son that he can't wow. admit truth about stealing a damn pizza? Where did I fail as a father where he's got to, feels like he's got to lie to me about that mm. three times to my face. And that was the pain mm -hmm. that I felt of seeing the look on his face. Like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And I always regretted that. And we talk to our kids, you know, about it now. We're coming into those years where they're seeking their independence. They're at those times where they'll say things to us and agree and maybe go off and do their own thing, make up their own mind. And so just having talks the other night about, look, there, there's, there's certain things I know you want to choose for yourself. Me and mom are not here to overprotect you. We're not here to tell you can't do that. Can't do that. We're saying, hey, 
we've been we've been there and know you're there and you're there in new places in ways that we haven't been but discuss this is a great term my buddy bart nags in austin texas who's raised three raised a few girls or moved out of the household and he said this to me a few weeks ago and i love this term and i think y'all gonna dig it he was like man in these teen years you can do one thing or what he goes try and maintain access mm. to, the, to them communicate mm. access mm. Yeah, because all yeah. the stories I hear is that there's that there there's a lot of parents go through boy fifteen to nineteen they zip it up non grata, and then at nineteen they come back one day and they go oh, yeah, everything you're saying I get it now thanks <laughs> you're going like but you, it's not over that quick man five years you put me through hell you know what I mean yeah. so if you can maintain access so we're trying to do that now um, and my parents were very Old Testament. You know, we, we, a lot of stuff. I've always said this. There's a lot of things I did not do as a kid that I should not have done. And I did not do them for fear of the punishment from my parents. Hmm. So there, I, there's some validity in that fear base. At the same time, I want to, I'm, I'm a little, I want to lean a little more into the New Testament. I keep bringing up uh, biblical uh, analogies here, but I want to lean, lean a little more into the, now let me show you why if you choose to have the discipline not to do that, how it's going to serve you. Mm. How, how that choice, maybe that sacrifice today will give you a greater reward down the line. Now, as we all know, what's the hardest thing to teach kids? Delayed gratification. They all think they're living forever mm. and today's the day and that's it. I mean, it's basically one of the hardest things to teach adults too. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we don't like to project at all and like make a sacrifice for a greater reward tomorrow. But boy, if I can get that where they can see, like, I see, you know, we've talked talk to the, our daughter. Well, do you want to be the, you know, the, 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 the girl that kisses the most guys early, maybe most popular that year, but come eighth grade, words kind of gotten around. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Reputation. Oh, da, da. So to just, again, just trying to lay out there, here's the possible consequences of your actions. Now, which one do you want to choose? And and, and, and they're all trying to new. You're trying to fit in. You go into middle school, you're trying to fit in. What do you want to be? You want to be popular. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's talk about this. Popular for what? We all want to be relevant. But relevant for what is a pretty doggone question to ask ourselves. Mm. And for how long term, you know, but it's hard to get children to project like, well, what's that going to mean in high school? What's that going to mean later in life? Because that's this, this, this the time to try things and fail. Mm -hmm. It's the time to stick your foot in your mouth. It's the time to ask so-and-so the problem when you think you're sure you got it and they say no. It's the time to get, be confused and come home and, you know, and just we're trying to keep access. I mean, so a lot of those things are things that my father did Put, put on us and expect from us. I think Camille and I are trying to do our best with going, realizing, I don't want to be, too, I don't want to be, I'm not going to be the old nostalgic parent mm. who says the stories. Well, back when I, mm. man, their life has changed. It's different. It's mm. similar to the same, but they have just so much more information coming out of them than we ever did, than I ever did. And you live in virtual, you have virtual relationships, you talk about projection, you know, their days or the social media, their days or go well or don't go well, depending on thumbs up or thumbs down. And so we talk about, you know, what does that mean? Again, what what's real and all that and what's not real. And I try to be honest with them. I go, look, I'm I'm your dad. I'm I'm I've got mom, I've got family, I'm successful. Does a good review of a movie feel better to me than a bad review? You damn right it does. Does somebody writing something about me completely false? that shows up in some news feed, even though I know it's completely false, does it affect me and make me feel physiologically a little, when I walk out the door? Yes, it does. You would think I would be able to be immune to that. Well, no, even me, I'm not. It's, it's, it, these are real and you're young. So I understand, be, be open and accessible to share with us. Oh, this hurt. And let's talk about, let's admit it hurt. Admit, and then talk about how much credence should we give it? You know, it's how much important import should we really give it? And let's talk about it. So we're trying to maintain access, I guess, in ways that you might say are a little more lenient New Testament than my parents yeah. did, but based on a lot of the same exact values that my parents instilled in me and my brother. 
Matthew, I feel like we could talk to you for five hours. I have so many questions I want to ask you, but just while we're on this topic of, do you, do you have four more hours? <laughs> just while we're on the topic of delayed gratification in your book, uh, Green Lights, you talk about sort of red light moments as opportunities for planting green light seeds. And I'm wondering what you've learned about, because I think in a red light moment, there are like heavy feelings that can also keep you trapped or stuck. So what have you learned about sort of like moving through those emotions so that you can get to that green light season and also take advantage of the season that's present for seed planting? Well, you know, and it's, it's sort of based off of the initial sort of equation I put at the beginning of the book is when faced with the inevitable, get relative. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we can be faced and we can admit and realize the inevitable, whatever happens in our life and get relative with now going forward, what's my decision making paradigm? I think the better. Now, biggest red light in my life, my dad died. I went through the pain, went through the morning. I still miss him. But the the green light is I got very, I was forced to get very courageous mm. in my life and to get courageous in finding my own identity and to put my ass on the line about what I stood for and what I stood against and, and, and look in the mirror and go, where you just been acting like what dad's been raising to be and where you've been really doing it. And I had to call myself out and I got very courageous actually in his learning, his mortality of him leaving. I was like, I don't have a safety net anymore. I don't have a crutch mm -hmm. and I can either go, Whoa, or I can go, let's go. And I remember a sobriety of mental and spiritual sobriety coming with his moving on where I went through it. I remember right now the world is flat and I looked further and my peripheral vision was clear. And I was like things that bothered me and failures that bothered me before when I did sort of have 10% relying on, if I really get in a pinch, he's got my back. Things that would bother me didn't bother me hmm. anymore. I just barged through things and exposed the mendacious things in my life that were like, that's not worth worrying over. And, and, and it was something about him leaving this life that did that, that made me go, because can, you can go two ways. Your loved one leaves life. You either shell up and go, oh my gosh, I'm afraid to live. Or you go, huh, we got a one-way ticket. We all got a one-way ticket. What are we doing? Let's get up and go find out. And if I if I if I trip and fall and screw up, f. Mm. So what? So I got I, I I tapped into that, and that's when I started to take chances and seek opportunities and get much more courageous and started plant seeds mm. that became green lights. Now, you know, more ethereal version of that, what I noticed later, and I would argue today to be true, is that to actually choose that and become more courageous to plant, start planting green light seeds when you're faced with a red light is actually honoring the red light. Mm. Yeah. And I believe when I did that, I look back, I was like, oh, you're actually, you're honoring dad, your dad, Matthew. If you'd have hold up and going, oh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not ready, that would not have been honoring. I'd throw myself in the ring in ways that I had never done before without looking over my shoulder saying, hey, you got my back? Because he wasn't there to have my back anymore. I felt like, and this is more of a recent realization, I felt like, oh, you were, that's that's a way of honoring that red light in your life. Um, putting it up on a pedestal, seeing it as painful, a harsh consequence, something you don't wish on anybody, but something you can damn sure rely on when it comes to somebody dying. And then going, all right, and I shine a light on that and make this a, a, a diving board, a springboard. There's a story in the book about your seventh grade poetry uh, competition that made me laugh out loud, uh, mostly because your mom reminded me of my mom in that moment. But it did make me think about you as a writer. You talk throughout the book about about your, I mean, it's comprised of a lot of your journal entries you've written since you were a teenager. And now you've written another book. You've written a book for children. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired that? Yeah. So being a parent, mm -hmm. uh, Penn, you know, you're a parent. Anybody else parents? You got parents? I, I'm, um, I'm pregnant. I'm going to have a baby soon. Okay. So the the, the prism, the, the lens you start looking through life through just changes. You're now a shepherd, at least, a postman, postwoman, at least. Mm. 
these one-off choices you can make going, I, if, if, if I fail, I, I, I'll get back up. Become, no, I'm, I'm making decisions for these dependents behind me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a different peripheral vision you get. So you start seeing life through that, making choices through um, measuring consequences for your, your young ones as well. And that consumes my mind a lot. Um, and when something's on my mind a lot, I have dreams about it. This was a dream I had, and I woke up at 2.30 in the morning, and I went and wrote it down, and all I had was the jingle. Just because they threw the dart mm. don't mean that it stuck. Mm. And just because I got some skills don't mean there is no luck. <laughs> and I remember going in. So it was a song. It, was, it, it was a song. I love that. It was a, I woke up and going, I got this great Bob Dylan ditty. And I was like, because, you know, you're wailing doesn't mean that you're a crier. Just because I lied does not mean that I'm a liar. And it just, and so the hook was just because, and I had the beat, and I just wrote from 2.30 to 6.30 in the morning. Wow. Went back, got in bed, got up and looked out. I was like, this is good. <laughs> wow. And I was, I was like, this is fun. And I sent it to, and I was like, I think this could be good for, for, uh, for, for people young because because there's also a lot of verses that i that are not in this book that are for more even older mm. people that are more i don't know a little more r-rated that are funny for adults too but i picked out these and i sent it to my book agent. he was like this could be this would be great for a children's book so i started sharing a bunch of the couplets with my own kids they liked them it started conversations mm. that i wanted was hoping to have they had different each one of them had different different take on each couplet in their own life and when they asked me questions i had a different take than their mother had on the same couplet in their own life um, so that's what I put together. It was, it was a ditty. It was, it was, it was a song and then, uh, um, really put it down and, and, and hopefully it's a great conversation starter between parents and youngsters. Matthew, will there be an audio book musical version of this? Of hey, this? Hey, I'll do the audio book. I think I'll do it this week. Amazing. Okay. I have a question about one of the couplets. Just because I mean, it doesn't mean I'm not lying. Can you share more about that? That one really struck me. Yeah, well, well... That's a, that's the difference between a bullshitter and a liar, right? <laughs> <laughs> but in this case, the person means it. He's saying just because I mean it doesn't mean I'm not lying. Uh, right, right. Well, this is a little... goes into that, I think, if you deconstruct when is it the right time to lie. Hmm. There you talk about the little elephant lies we talk about. You know, yes, go be honest, but if you can sit there and say something to the proverbial bad guy in the situation that can preserve or buy you more time to preserve the good people or your family, whatever. Relatively, that's a good time to, to tell a fib, you know, and, 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 and know you are, it's a little bit of that. Uh, um, also, you know, the, you've heard the little uh, analogy, the, uh, grandfather and grandson, they're in the South, the tornado is coming. The, the, the grandson drops on his knees and starts praying. He's like, get, get your ass up. <laughs> <What? laughs> Scared prayer ain't, ain't stopping the damn tornado. We got to go get shelter. It's it's a little bit like, yeah, I know you're told you're, you're in strife to go pray for it. No, we got to take action. Mm. It's it's it, it leans into that a little bit just because, uh, I, I mean, it doesn't mean I'm not lying. You can mean something. Um, it's a little bit like that. Just because I did it again doesn't mean I don't regret it. Sometimes we're like, I'll take the consequences, man. I, I, I'll do it again. And yep, guilty. Catch me. And that's the second time I did it. But I want that cookie so much. <laughs> I'll take the damn consequences. Who took the last cookie? That was me. Yes, I regret it because I regret what may happen to me. But it, the want, the need at the time, <laughs> overrode possible consequences. Sign me up. It's it's a bit it's a bit of that. Sometimes we just do it, mm. and we're like, I'll 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 deal with the consequences. Um, I'm 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 fibbing, but I mean it. You know what I mean? It's it's and it ladles it does ladle into. So if what you're talking about a little of that story, with the existential logic of my <laughs> mother, telling me you know this poem that she loved this Anne Ashbery poem. If you, you understand that. Yes, I understand. Does it mean something? You have? Yes, it means it to me. What does it mean? I tell her. She's like, well, there you go. Then it's yours. I'm like, well. He, I mean, he won I, I the competition with that poem. <laughs> I won. <laughs> he, had written, he had written his own poem and showed it to his mom, and she said, no, use this poem. <laughs> wow. Uh, and then it also leans into Drama. Poetry, 
symbolism, magic reality, sometimes, a lot of times, art, the image, can tell more truth about the situation than the actual detailed factoid words mm. about the exact mathematics of the situation. Does that mean that the art, the image is a lie? It's not really what happened. It's not factual. It's not, you know, baseline truth, uh, um, facts. But you ask someone what they got from that and what they got from the from the report, <laughs> you know, and you know, I, I understand a lot more from from this. The longer the longer machinations of what 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 it, what it says about life. So it's it just it just leans into that about you know. I don't want to be such, I don't want to have to tell kids and I don't think it's right. Best to tell kids, Hey, you have to, it has to be the, cause I've done it to myself lived in times where I'm like, it has to be the absolute single truth. You make sure you, all of a sudden I was like, no fun to be around. I didn't have any of the BS mm. we were talking about pen. I didn't, I, I didn't see art and things. I couldn't make a poem, you know, make something rhyme. Cause I was like, no, no, no. Need the, the facts, the facts should be just it. Well, they're pretty dry sometimes. So where do you give a flower? Or where do you where do you where do you throw a beer in there? Where do you have some fun and break a sweat and go? I it, 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 I'm not sure. It's not as much about you know the reason. I I needed the rhyme. Thank you for the rhyme. Now now I can fly. Geez, all this reasoning, all this logic, especially with us passionate animals. I'm reminded every single day. Get and I'm a big logic guy. Get off your logic high horse, McConaughey. <laughs> we are passionate animals. Logic is usually usually not the answer, especially in relationship. Hmm. I really want Penn to have a chance. I feel like Sophie and I have been so eager, yeah. but I want to ask you one more question and then I'll yield yield the time to Penn. <laughs> uh, just while we're on the topic of love, I've heard you say that in periods, during periods of time when we're looking for love, we can be intrusive and we can sort of get out of ourselves. Um, and instead of inviting someone, we kind of intrude on them and that it's important to stay in yourself and invite. And I thought that was really pertinent to some things I've been experiencing and just like really well said. And I wondered if you could just share a little bit more about that difference between intrusion and, and invitation. Yeah. Well, the most attractive people I know in life, male and female, they never intrude. They never trespass. I just sent out a birthday wish to a 90 year old man who just turned 90 today. And I was like telling him one of my favorite things about you is never, you never trespass. Hmm. They always hold sort of the constitutions here. They don't, Lean in. I just lost a buddy, John Cheney, at 78. And one of the most attractive things, he just, people were attracted to him of all ages and sexes because he just always, he walked everywhere. He didn't run. He came into a situation. He held on all of a sudden and be the last one to speak up. And when he did, people were like, that's the idea. Um, and it was part of it. He never got out of himself. My friend Jake Weber never does that, never leans in. And it's something very attractive. You, you become a magnet when you're yourself and you have a place in a situation and you're not trying to be first in line or interrupt or the first one to speak or, hey, let me get in front of you. There's an eagerness to that that's not as attractive usually um, when it comes to uh, relationships, mm -hmm. I find. Um, uh, I I catch myself doing it all the time. I'll be intrusive and I may be getting all the points across, but, I, but have, people aren't listening near as well because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like, wanted to have the right and best answer each time right away and first that's a bit intrusive and it's a bit like okay uh um but to sit back have a listen be present and then all of a sudden someone goes and what's your opinion on that and you give it it means a lot it's like i talk about you know uh to coaches all the time of of, of young teams there's the coaches that yell everything and then the coaches that talk like this and coach and on certain things at certain times, you have to raise your voice. Well, youngsters listen a lot more to that second example because when the coach raises their voice, oh, this is an exclamation mark. This means something in particular. The ones that's yelling all the time, they start to mute it out. They're like, I don't know what's more important than the last thing. Mm -hmm. You're yelling everything. That's a bit intrusive. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it takes a certain confidence and presence to not be intrusive, to not trespass, to sit back and read the context of a room of someone else, um, to catch an eye. Look, I, I when I first night I met Camilla, I started off being intrusive. I started off waving, trying to get her attention. 
And I don't know to this day if she caught if she caught my eye, but chose to ignore it. But I'm glad she ignored it because if she'd have caught my eye doing this, and I'd have followed through with, "Hey, will you come over here?" I don't know. I, I, I'd have, that would be my first boat <laughs> right there. I don't think I'd be here now with her and the family. But evidently, if she did not catch my eye long enough for me to go, "Hey, can you hear my mom's voice?" At 12 in my ear going, you, ain't, you don't wave this woman over to you across the room. Boy, get your ass up and go introduce yourself. And I went, that's right. <laughs> got up, went over and did go. Now I was on the right track. Much less intrusive, mm -hmm. much less lazy, much more respectful. Um, then to look in relationships with friends as well. You start off with great friendships when it's easy to say no. Hmm. Want a friendship where no is just as easy as yes, right? Hey, can you make it to this thing? No, I can't. I'm going to. Cool. That's a great friendship. Mm, yeah. <laughs> what happens? We start to get to know each other well enough. We start to, the next time out, we're like, hey, it's no big deal. You know, it's easy either way. I just want to let you know if you know if you could. <laughs> and that's, well, why are you using so many words? But you and I were so good on, yeah, no. And now we're starting to kind of explain ourselves. And now we start to go like, well, I no, I'm not going to make it. I can't make it. Well, I can make it, but I don't want it. And all of a sudden we're explaining too much and the relationship's getting complicated. And we're like, ah, oh, can we go back to when it was just easy? When yeah, I, it was either yeah or no. And I wanted to, and you didn't put pressure on me and I didn't have expectations on you. And it was just a yes or no. And we were clean and cool, man. I talk so much less, explain so much less, let each other down proverbially easier, so much less. And I wasn't let down when you said no. Because I didn't need you to say yes to, to fill me. Mm. Those, you know, when, when we lose that part in a relationship, it's hard to get back to. But we have to, I've been on many relationships that get that, take that slippery slope. And I'm have to come back and try and intervene and go, hey, let's make sure we keep our friendship simple. Part of our friendship is based on, we don't have to talk every day. We don't have to talk every week. We don't have to talk every month. But every time I see you, we pick right back up. And I don't feel like I owe you anything. You don't owe me nothing. And that's why we keep getting along so well. Because it's a free exchange. Those friendships, some of those friendships are awesome, you know, um, but they're not intrusive and they slowly mm -hmm. can become a little more intrusive when you kind of letting someone know through your verbiage to feel a little guilty if you tell me no on this and, you know, and you're starting to use too many adjectives and adverbs and flower up the language like we speak straight, man. Mm -hmm. When do we get to, you know, it's 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 some some relationships are, are hard to maintain like that, but very nice when they are. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of, because uh, we're, we're coming to a close here, um, it makes me think of how we speak to children and how we speak to our children, you know? That's kind of, that's the place in life where I'm finding maybe the most ability and the most courage to be simple, you know, and straightforward, to trust that. So that's a beautiful gift. But I'm just wondering about, um, so you've shared some about how, how, how you, how you, how you've been parenting, but our final question of every episode is if you could go back to your 12 year old self, what would you say or do? You know, the question is kind of growing with us because yeah. it's a, it's a simple question. And, and then I think there's levels to it because what, what, what I also like yeah. to think about is what would it take for your 12 year old you to listen, you know? So I'm just curious, what, what would you say or do? Um, I believe I'd say, um, don't be in such a rush to be 13, <laughs> um, which I was. And I can look back at my ambitions for being, you know, to be cool was success in that. It's to be older, be more like my older brother, to be a sir, a father, like my father. These were, mm. these were dreams and ambitions. Um, and now I know that I can't completely say it because I would say, that it served that that pursuit served me well, but I do remember. I tell my children, I don't miss out on these these years that you are right now. These, these are first times. You're gonna run out of first times. Mm. Getting first times right now, man. And don't be in a rush because once there's only one first time. First kiss, first kiss, first heartbreak. You're gonna get them for the for first time. And when we rush. And I would say I'm I'm guilty of this. We can become we can rush those first times, and the second time and third time we we can become a little more callous, mm. maybe. 
we can lose a certain innocence. And then if you rush it later in life, what adults do is they become cynics. Totally. They go from, you become obviously very young age, first heartbreak. We talked about earlier. I love you. I love you back. I break up with you. I became skeptical. I didn't become cynical. But what happens in older life, I think one of the biggest diseases we have with adulthood is cynicism. Mm. Mm. Skepticism, all right. That's knowledge. That's the context. I say, let me measure this. But not cynicism. Um, but I would say don't rush to be 13 because it's coming. Trusting that it's coming. We all think we're going to miss. You know, that that party tonight, God, I know we said we home at nine, but then the, the, the boys all went down for another part. That that party tonight, that this is going to be the one. And if I miss tonight, I miss it all. Well, actually, you know what? They're a little older than you, Levi. You've had a great day with them. Let them go do their young male things. Their things that are a little older than you. And actually, by you not being there, they're probably going to have a little more respect for you by you not being there. But you said, hey, I enjoyed my lane today. I hung with my friends, surfed, did these things. But now you are, you are older, guys. You're going to go off, and there's going to be girls and a party and alcohol. Yo, yo, go ahead. They'll actually go. Because we get all, you know what we want to do? We want to overstay our welcome. We want to be, I always wanted to be the last one to leave everything. <laughs> and that was version of me rushing to be 13 at 13, rushing to be 14, rushing to be 15. In many ways, it served me well. But if I could go back, I'd say, don't rush to be 13. To my 12 year old self, don't rush to be 13. It's coming regardless. <laughs> I think that's excellent. Matthew, this was so yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I feel like it flew by. Yeah. It did. Yeah, it did fly, but it's fun to talk about this great life stuff. Yeah. Great stuff. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I just want to ask you something about your book cover. Sort of if, if, if you have a couple more minutes. I was struck by your description being that you're, it says Matthew is a storyteller, a treehouse builder, and a pickle expert. What are the right. top three attributes of a great pickle? I just really want to know. Pickle, great pickle, firm, cold. I like them. We got to be cold. No one likes a warm pickle. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, and I'm I'm a mini I'm a mini kosher. Yes, joke. that all sounds I like, great. I want I want to hear that sound like a um, not as stiff as a carrot, but close. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm not a you know mm. pickles just 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 have so much going on. You're right. More than their young brother, the cucumber. Yeah. I mean, what's a cucumber about besides taking up space in your salad? It has no taste. <laughs> <laughs> It's got identity. It comes out of the gate. You know what it is. <laughs> it, it, it's it, it may it's weathered. It's got some scars on it. It's done its time. And it really knows who it is. Cucumbers great. <laughs> I don't know. Put them on your eye. They give you a little water. I think. Other than that, it's kind of take up room in your salad, but not the pickle. <laughs> I love this. You're, I, I'm honestly pickle. salivating. I know. I want a pickle. I'm going to go eat a pickle. I do love pickles. <laughs> yeah. thank you Matthew, so thank you so much, much for stopping you. by. Hey, Prish, anytime. Thanks for, thanks for taking the time to talk with me. Hey, I know y'all said headphones, but I'm. I, I think we're pretty clear. I haven't needed them okay. in the past. Okay. If we're, wait, well, y'all got a little nervous. <laughs> yeah, no, you know what? Listen, <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Zombie was like, okay. 